Good evening. Tonight is Wednesday, April 21st, 2021. Uh, welcome to the meeting of the Gilderland Central School District Equity and Diversity Committee as we call the meeting to order. Uh, we're going to start by reciting the pledge. If you can join along with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with justice, liberty, and justice for all. Uh, as we move on to our agenda, um, can I have a motion to approve the minutes from March 24th? Mirzad, is that a motion? And a second? Kelly? Any comments? All in favor? Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Uh, next, we have the public comment, pub the public portion of our meeting, the public comment. Um, if you'll notice on the board portal, we did post um, the board policy 1230, um, which uh, does go over the guidelines for public participation and public comment. So any public comment um, will have been sent prior to uh, 4 p.m. on the day of the meeting. Um, and um, we did receive two comments for tonight's public comment. I am just going to, um, I'm just gonna draw your attention to the fourth paragraph um, where it does um, say that in general, comments should not exceed three to four minutes and should relate to school matters. So um, I am gonna ask Dr. Wiles to help me with that timing. Um, so Dr. Wiles, if we get to like three minutes and 45 to 50 seconds, if you could give me, um, if you could give me a little warning, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, the, first, the first public comment is by Michael DeLuke. Dear members of the Equity and Diversity Committee, I would like to begin by thanking the numerous members of our community who reached out to Renee and me in support of the letter we submitted to the March 16th meeting of the Board of Education. It was wonderful to learn that so many people of all different races agree with the concerns we expressed and the questions we raised, and your input has motivated us to continue to press the administration, the Board of Education, and the Equity and Diversity Committee for answers on this very important topic. I would also like to thank Dr. Rivera for her apology at last week's Board of Education meeting and for confirming that I was never invited to attend an um, Equity and Diversity Committee meeting and therefore never declined such an invitation. It is my understanding that this evening the committee will be discussing how to define such terms as equity, diversity, and inclusion. Regarding equity, there has been a great deal of conversation on a local, state, and national level about racial equity as opposed to racial equality in our schools. Equality is clearly understood to mean that everyone is given the same opportunity, regardless of their race, ethnicity, or religion. But what is equity, especially as it relates to race relations? Some have said that racial equity is the process of leveling the playing field for all. Others have said that it is giving people of certain races what they need to achieve an equal outcome or to make things fair. In January, I wrote to the Equity and Diversity Committee and asked them to define equity and explain how it differs from equality. In late March, after a great deal of persistence, I finally received an answer from Superintendent Wiles. She referred me to the well-circulated picture of three people of different heights trying to see over a fence. I have included the picture in the letter for those who have not seen it. I believe, the, um, I believe this will be in our, um, in our portal tomorrow, but you'll be able to see the picture. Um, I can describe it at the end if you need to. While at first glance, this seems logical, the taller person who can already see over the fence gives his box to the shorter person who cannot, I contend that when you apply it to real life, it is an oversimplification of an extraordinarily complex issue, as life is not made up of equal sized boxes and level fences. I therefore ask the members of the Equity and Diversity Committee the following questions. What does each of the people of different heights represent? Do the heights correspond to the color of a child's skin? If so, which heights represent which skin colors? What do the boxes represent? What does the fence represent? The parents and children in the Gilderland Central School District deserve to know how this schematic provided by our superintendent applies to our children's education. Parents also deserve to know how the district plans to implement racial equity in our schools. Stated differently, who will determine which children need these advantages and how will the advantages be applied? Are the teachers going to have to ask questions, ask students their race in order to determine to whom they should provide these advantages or will the teachers just take a guess based upon the apparent 
color of a student's skin. Once they determine a student's race, will the teachers then have different grade grading standards for students of different races? If so, that's bigotry disguised as equity, and it flies in the face of equality and the colorblind meritocracy promoted by the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Is that it, Dr. Miles? That's three minutes and 40 seconds. So I'll, I'll just read another, another couple of sentences or two. Um, are the equity, diversity, um, equity and Diversity Committee, Board of Education and or administration of the Gilderland Central School District going to use racial equity and the notion that America is systemically racist as a way to alter our children's education curriculum? Are they going to adopt anti-racist programs such as critical race theory or the 1619 project? which promote the notion that America was founded as a slaveocracy and that colorblindness endangers student, student safety. So there we are at four minutes. There, there is quite a bit more. It will be posted. Um, it will be posted on the portal um, for everybody in the public to see as well as everybody on the committee to see. Um, but that was public comment number one. Um, public comment number two is by um, Jingling Lee. Is that correct, Dr. Wiles? Um, thank you. Hi, as an Asian American parent who has two children going to school in Gilderland, I'm deeply concerned with the uprising of anti-Asian sentiment in this country and how it affects our Asian kids. Does the district have any plan on education of systemic racism against Asian and bring awareness to our community? The public school system in this country has curriculum that addresses dark history of slavery, but turns a blind eye to the equally oppressive history upon Asian Americans since 1800s with the Chinese Exclusion Act as its peak manifesto. Since COVID-19 breakout, Donald Trump administration has scapegoated Chinese by maliciously calling Chinese virus, Kung flu, etc. And such, such rhetoric greatly damaged images, Asians American, and pour oil on flames of racism and xenophobia. Does Gilderland School District have any plan on rebuking such dangerous rhetoric? Asian Americans are not a disease. Asian Americans are as patriotic as white Americans and black Americans. Asian Americans have worked hard and contributed all we can to this country and will continue to do so. But we need Gilderland School District to hear our voice and stand up for our kids. Thank you. Okay, um, that was the, um, the second public comment. Um, so um, as we go over our agenda today, we have three, um, three main items. The first one um, is an overview of our current equity work. So we're gonna hear both from Dr. Wiles and Dr. Elliott. Um, Dr. Wiles, can I ask you to begin? Uh, thanks, Dr. Hralchek. So let me uh, just set the stage just a bit before I um, uh, share some information with the committee and with our community. When we were planning this meeting, we thought it would make some sense to provide some context to everyone about equity work that is already uh, going on and is underway within the Gilderland Central School District. Um, and we wanted to look at it across the, across the district at the elementary, middle, and high school level. So I asked um, Dr. Damian Singleton to uh, assist in kind of putting all that together. And so he, he did that. He provided a bit of a retrospective of work related to equity um, going back uh, several years. And it's in a chart form that I'm gonna share with you. Um, but I, I just want to, um, I guess, indicate that I'm pinch hitting a little bit tonight. So um, I'm gonna do the best I can to do justice to his very thorough work. Uh, so give me one minute to share my screen here and, and uh, we'll begin. So I know this is very small, so this will be included in your minutes. Um, and I, I'm not gonna go through and read all of this, but I, I do wanna hit some highlights and I because I think it will um, harken back to some of the early co conversations of this committee about what does it mean to serve all students and to think about equity. Um, so I'm gonna quickly go back to um, really the first time we spent some uh, invested some time and effort into thinking about how we serve all students. Um, and that was back in 2014-15, where we began looking at inclusive um, school practices. And we did quite a bit of work with Dr. Julie Costin from Syracuse University. 
Um, and we really spent some time taking a hard look at how we serve our students with disabilities and our English language learners. Uh, we looked at lots and lots of data uh, around how those students were doing in our programs, and we found some things that we saw needed to change. Um, for example, at the high school, um, our lowest track of, of um, coursework was primarily populated by students with disabilities, um, students of color, and economically disadvantaged students. So we spent the next several years trying to dismantle that. Um, we removed the course um, level called core, so that no longer exists. Um, we continued with that work doing some professional development into 2015, 2016. You'll notice that the leadership team at our administrative retreat continued working with Dr. Julie Costin. And then we did many professional development opportunities for our faculty and staff. You see the reference to um, our core programs and um, that were continuing. That continued still into 16, 17, um, where we were uh, focusing on creating inclusive schools for all. We did uh, several kinds of training. Let's see if I've kept up with myself here. Whoops. Um, we talked about the um, universal design for learning. We did sensitivity training. We did cultural awareness. We focused on DASA that year and worked with uh, Dr. Amanda Nickerson out of, I believe it's the University of Buffalo or SUNY Buffalo. I, I apologize if I don't have that correct. Um, we also looked at um, humanistic behavior strategies and we actually presented at the Inclusive Schools Leadership Institute in, at Syracuse University. In 1718, we expanded our co-taught courses. I know our board members on this call will remember many conversations about um, looking at those courses and hiring staff and doing professional development, and we continue to support those programs to this day. Um, and then you can see some additional professional development we did in that area. The what, the why, the how of inclusive education. Uh, we worked with Dr. Richard Villa, who's very well known in that, in that area. Um, but during this time, we were also very sensitive to supporting um, our students who are transgender or gender fluid. We worked closely with Lyndon Cudlitz, who, um, provided professional development and gave us guidance in how we think about and thought about working with those students. Um, we also worked with Jennifer Bashant, who offered us um, professional development on mindful classrooms. Right around this time, the Every uh, Student Succeeds Act became um, the, the law of the land and all school districts were required to look at baseline data about how our subgroup populations of students were succeeding. Um, we began that at that point. In 2018-19, um, we continued with our efforts around professional development. We did bias training for our aides and monitors. Uh, we looked at culturally sensitive, uh, cu cu cultural sensitivity and awareness, the culturally responsive classroom, and promoting equity and inclusion. This began uh, our work with Dr. Stacy Williams from um, Marist College. Uh, we also looked at foundations and understanding and supporting our LGBTQ students, again with London Cudlitz. Um, and again, we continued with working on our ESSA data and understanding how our subgroups were performing so that we could adjust um, uh, our, our delivery of instruction and our support for those students accordingly. And then in 1920, we had a major program report to our Board of Education around Every Student Succeeds Act, which has many tentacles to it. And you'll see them there around professional development, around curriculum, um, around uh, accountability as well, as we think about measures of interim progress and um, all of that that, that entails. But in our professional development, which is, I think, where we, we spent a great deal of time, we tried to read different books as a starting point for conversation and discussion in our own learning. Um, and then 
curriculum work was begun in earnest really to think about diversifying the kinds of um, materials our students have access to, particularly around um, uh, titles that are available in our classroom libraries and our regular libraries in our schools. Um, Dee Johnson can probably uh, corroborate this as we looked for diverse authors, characters, settings, and themes. So our students could uh, read about student other characters who looked like them. So that work continued on um, during that time. And then, you know, this past year, which has been, of course, characterized by, you know, any number of um, challenges and let's do things differently. We still tried to stay the course of keeping a focus on how we're serving all students, thinking about equity. Um, and a couple of the things that we were able to accomplish, um, and that is to create a couple new courses. Um, and then also the creation of um, this actual committee that's beginning its work. Um, and also you'll hear shortly from um, Shannon Elliott about the work that's happening at the high school. So that was a skating history through the last several years. And the point being this, and of course you can study this when it's in the minutes in some detail, is that we have been in, in very much concerned about our ability to understand the needs of all students and adjust how we support them based on the needs that they have. So I am sure I did not give the work of Damian Singleton justice, um, but I will pause there and um, stand for any questions that anyone on the committee might have. I'm gonna Marie, do you want to take questions now? Do we want to have Dr. Elliot do her presentation? Um, why don't we listen um, listen to the second presentation and then we we can take questions from everyone. So Sounds great. One more second to share my screen. Perfect. Dr. Elliot, you can give Dr. Wiles the, the go ahead for the next slide because she's going to share, okay? Go ahead. <laughs> Hold on. Thank you. Let's see. Hold on. That didn't work. Okay, here we come. All right, do you perfect? Okay. Um, I am um I'm so grateful to be, you know, asked to come and speak about the work uh, that we're doing at the high school. Um, Dr. Singleton asked me to um, take take over the the committee from Amy Haralchek when um, she went to another another position um, to facilitate and help keep this group moving along. So I'm very happy to be doing that. I have a four slide presentation and I want you to know that all of the images, the artwork and the photographs are done by Gilderland High School students. Next slide. Okay, so um, this slide, at the top of it um, has one, uh, one of the components of the mission statement uh, that we are determined to foster and promote a more inclusive school environment where kids, where students feel safe. Um, so, you know, with that, I wanted to offer that a reminder, and we all know this, but students learning is deeper when they feel safe accepted and included. And that was, um, this little piece was from the National Science Teachers Association. So it happens in all subject areas. When students see themselves reflected in the curriculum, they connect more, which is just common sense. Why are we working on this? What is the problem that we have? And the problem is that not all of our students feel safe they don't all feel heard or secure at Gilderland High School. 
because of who they are. That is our problem. How do we know this? We know this because they have told us. And truly, I don't know that we need more than that. We should honor that. However, if we're looking for data to support our actions, we can also just look at our demographics. Our demographics have changed significantly over the past 10 years. So if we are doing the same things that we were doing 10 years ago, we are not reflecting our student population. So that in and of itself is another rationale for the work that we need to do, not to give certain students advantages, but rather level the playing field. Next slide. So with our anti-racism committee, we have five strands. One is the building messaging strand. These are subcommittees. And so far, um, you know, the building messaging, uh, they're, job is to really promote the mission statement, um, create awareness. They've um, done some programming in homerooms using the GHS reporter, um, things like that. The student voice subcommittee is another component. Um, and they have worked with students to create posters. Students made posters about um, uh, anti-racism and how they feel. And currently um, there are two sets of posters hanging in the school building and some are um, uh, really highlighting um, students' concern about uh, the need to stop Asian hate. And so um, those are hanging in the hallways. We also have a, a program that we have begun um, uh, anti-racism allies, and those are teachers and staff who have volunteered to be allies for students, to be identified as um, a teacher who a student knows um, he or she or they could go to in order to get support, especially in areas where um, they may feel, um, you know, unsafe or, or not accepted. That does not mean that they can't go to any teacher. Of course they can. But these are these teachers have made a commitment to learning about anti-racism and are prepared for these conversations. And we're hoping to have that population of, of teachers and staff grow. Um, there are um, many, well, we've done a lot. Um, Students are preparing communication about the um, uh, anti-racism allies uh, for parents and for students so that everyone has that awareness. And, um, you know, one of the things that we, we ask is that as we are starting up many of these initiatives, you know, it takes time to, for communication to happen. And so we ask that um, people understand that, but we are working on that um, diligently. Um, we have uh, established a website for the anti-racism committee um, and that is in the beginning stages. Um, the graphic design teacher has offered to help um, create imagery for that page, but it's also a page for resources for teachers um, for the mission statement and, and um, those kinds of things. Uh, we have <clears throat> an Instagram and students are able to um, post messages, but they also work with our um, social media expert so that to make sure that the messages are, uh, will be clearly understood. So um, it's done with, it's done thoughtfully and with care. Another um, strand is the professional development strand. Um, we've done book reads. Uh, we've created a document of um, multitude of resources for teachers. Um, and we have some plans to bring in some speakers and workshops, uh, profession, other professional development 
One in particular would be on brain research and bias um, and other uh, professional development sessions to build capacity. Um, I, there's, we have three workshops scheduled um, for uh, completing the narrative in terms of broadening our curriculum so that it does reflect our student population. Another strand that we have is focusing on um, reactive planning and discipline. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Oh, oh you're there. Okay. Um, and that is, you know, how to um, being prepared for when we have crisis situations um, and, and also looking at aspects of discipline which may not be, um, uh, which, which may, you know, need to be adjusted um, so that our practices are, are fair and equitable. Um, we are also looking at um, using, and we have been, some restorative justice practices, but we are researching um, in particular uh, one aspect of discipline um, just to see, you know, who we are and, and how we've been doing. Um, one of our teachers um, also helped uh, present with some high school students to third and fourth graders at, at one of our elementary schools um, to increase understanding about um, how we treat others in, in terms of racism and anti-racism. Another uh, aspect is our staff outreach, and we have some projects in um, uh, in the works in terms of uh, one. Um, Matt Pinchinot and I are are creating um, a video project based on the Tyler Merritt project, and we'll have more that we can share on that later. It's really in its infancy. Um, Ideas for next year may include some um, possible action research, uh, for example, um, to explore new ways to call on students. Um, so because research has shown that teachers, even when they want to be, um, can still, um, you know, not be random in their um, in choosing students for participation. And again, it's it's these types of things that we want to do, we want to investigate our own practices so that we can create um, a school in which all of our students feel accepted and comfortable. And I think that's what I've got and I'm happy to give more information and answer questions. Thank you, Shannon, much appreciated. You're welcome. So we will open up uh, the group to questions, either to the information um, that Dr. Bile shared or that Dr. Elliot shared. Um, Leah, we'll start with you. I just want to thank Dr. Elliot. That was very inspiring and encouraging to hear about. That that work is excellent and has pulled me out of a really low point I felt for a couple of days about race in America, and that that gave me a lot of hope and excitement. So thank you for your thorough presentation and the hard work you're doing. You're welcome. I'll echo that as we move to Maxine. Um, I had a quick question about the statistics you showed. Um, something that I noticed was as a multiracial person, I did not see myself represented in those. So I was wondering if there were anything you had to say about either the population is too small or why there aren't statistics on that. Uh, the answer is, I put this together very quickly, and the statistic for multiracial is 3.7, and I just didn't, I didn't, I just chose four areas on my slide. So I'm sorry about that, um, but you are absolutely included. Uh, Nicole. Nicole, hard to tell if you're frozen. Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Yeah. 
my mute my mute wasn't um no so thank you both those uh both were very those were very thorough presentations and and really exciting to hear the work that's been going on um dr Elliot, i was really excited to hear about some of the restorative practices you were talking about with disciplinary um responses and, and whatnot and i was wondering if you could provide a little more detail because that I think is a great practice and it is up and coming and, and fair. So I didn't know if there was more information you could share. You know, when I'm presenting, I don't always remember exactly everything I've said, um, but I wanted to make sure to say something about our training for understanding program, which is a component of the restorative practices, but Dr. Haralchek can talk about that because she was, yeah. well, to help start it. Yeah, yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. I, you know, um, I think that um, as of yet, unless it's happened in the last couple of months, there hasn't been um, um, a lot of people who have attended like the big restorative justice um, trainings that you might you might be thinking of. Um, we did have a, a little restorative practices training for a small subset of staff last year, but um, the administrative team at the high school has really been working on taking a more counseling approach to discipline when it's when it's at all possible. Um, that does take a lot of time, but we really find that developing the relationships um, with the students um, really makes a difference in the long run. And there were a couple specific um, infractions that we chose, um, that we chose a more, you know, in addition to the counseling piece, a more restorative piece where the students would really do some research and a little more understanding on the impact um, of, of what the issue was. If that if that helps explain that piece of it, um, Elizabeth and then Mirza. Um, I just wanted to say I I love the artwork in the presentation. It was great, uh, really arresting images, and um, I remember some of them that have been shown before at board meetings, like the one melting pot. Um, that person is a really great artist, and it just looks like there's a lot of really excellent artists in Gillen High School, which is really exciting, and I'd be excited to see the posters that are hanging up there now. Um, and uh, so anyway, that was really neat and I'm um, happy to see those. And I wondered about the courses that you mentioned, Murray. Um, there's two courses, Black History in the US and the History of American, African American Civil Rights. I was just wondering like, what are those all about? Are they in the high school? And like, what are, how do they work? Like, are they electives or? Um, yes, they are high school courses and they are electives. Um, we, those courses were brought um, under development last year and then brought forward to our um, leadership team, discussed and then placed in the course catalog I, um, and offered this, this year as electives. I, I don't know the numbers of students who have signed up for them, but um, I know you didn't ask me that, but I'm, as I'm talking, I'm thinking that's something that you would be curious about and I would be happy to get those numbers and, and include them on this chart when I put it in the minutes. Thanks, Dr. Riles. Mirzad, then Andy. Well, I found both presentations to be great, nice and thorough, you know, full of information. And uh, like Leah said, very inspiring. The one question that I had <clears throat> was regarding the website um, that we're hoping to put together for the Anti-Racism Committee. So I know we spoke about the resources that we want to provide, especially for teachers. What kind of resources do we want to put forward for students within that, as well as um, when this website is published will it be found under the i believe now we have an anti-racism in gilderland tab on our on our website will it be under that yes you'll be able to find it there and um there are resources for students but it's also a place for students to decide and have a voice and put resources there so it's not it's i i want to to make sure that uh, it's clear that this is also coming from students. It's not just teacher driven or, or middle-aged administrator driven. <laughs> I'll add too that if the students on our, on our call tonight have um, anything they wanna add you know, about their involvement or the student voice, feel free to, um, feel free to unmute and talk because your um, involvement has just been uh, awesome and inspiring. Um, Andy, then Gloria. 
Hi, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Wiles, you mentioned that you folks did some work on mindful classroom, and uh, mindfulness is a pretty widespread practice in business and uh, in counseling that's been very effective. Uh, so, is this something that is ongoing or has it been institutionalized in any way? Can you give us some more information about that? Well, I, I hate to say anything is institutionalized because um, it isn't. I, I would say it's ongoing and we are continuing to learn more about the mindful classroom. It's, um, but I would call it more of a work in progress than a widespread um, approach. Thanks, Dr. Wiles. Gloria? Trying to unmute. Um, thank you both for the presentations. It, I agree with Nicole. It, it's kind of so, it's so exciting to hear what's going on. But what it made me think of, especially Dr. Wild, when you were listing what Damien's, uh, you know, what he put together, uh, it kept bringing me back to that article we read uh, on professional development, uh, the Tucker Smith article. And I, I guess I kept wondering as, you know, because having taught in Gilderland, I went through many professional developments, but that article really made me think uh, beyond just you know, we go to conferences, we go to workshops, we hear, we get excited, and we leave, and then what? Uh, so I was thinking, you know, with all these things that we've been doing along the way, I guess I'm curious as to what's, what, what has it changed in our, has it, has it gone as deep as this person talks about? You know, has it gone from the, the words to the actions? Has it changed our policies in any way? Has it changed classrooms in any way? And I think that would be something I'd be really interested in knowing because the, the the listing of what we've done, and I did get to participate in a couple as a board member, but uh, I'd be curious as to how we use that professional development. And because that that article really made me think about what we do with the work we you know we invest in. I'll I'll just say this, and we have a couple administrators on the call who might want to jump in. Uh, we all know that going to a workshop is, um, you know, it's great, but it doesn't necessarily change practice when you're back in your classroom and that it doesn't happen overnight, but it's really a function of being embedded in your day to day and then being supported um, in, you know, small ways and in large ways. So I know a lot of the work that happens um, in classrooms is supported by our instructional administrators who are in the classrooms watching teachers work with students and um, engaging in conversations about practice that capture some of the learning that happened in those kinds of workshops. That has to happen day after day. It has to be something that we're looking for in nurturing and supporting and talking about. So we are not just, um, saying, well, you heard the message and now go do your thing. It really has to be, what does this message mean for me as an individual teacher and the students that I have? Um, so that's, I think, the work of our IAs. And I, I see Mike Laster's hand, so I have a feeling he's gonna take me up on that offer to weigh in at the building level. Thanks, Marie. Uh, Gloria, I can <clears throat> talk about a specific example that within the last few years has been fantastic uh, for us to be able to support. Um, when we started to introduce the CRS framework, the culturally responsive uh, uh, sustaining framework at the middle school, uh, many of our teachers started to implement some of those best practices. Uh, it, it got taken to the next level when uh, Nancy Clondolan and uh, Emily Minot actually presented at a national uh, AMLE conference, uh, uh, Association of Middle Level Education Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. That was about two years ago, where they went and highlighted some of the uh, practices that they were starting to implement in their English and social studies classrooms uh, in regards to that CRS framework. So in terms of in terms of like the behavior change and the instructional practices that are changing because of this conversation, um, it's happening. It's happening more, more than more, more often than we know, and the frequency uh, has increased every year since we're having this conversation. So uh, I would point to that one example of how uh, you know the awareness has actually resulted in some changes in, in instructional practice and selections of texts and different things like that. So, thanks, Mike, Barb. 
Yes, I have a couple of questions. As we list the resources, are we being careful about not just taking one point of view uh, with particular black authors? I'm talking about say Kendi and that we offer the students and the teachers uh, checks or writings by black authors who are more of the Martin Luther King variety, who you know believe that character and things such as that uh, are very, very important in, in judging a person versus judging by skin color. And I just want to be really careful that as you provide the resources, both to the community, our students, and our teachers, that we sort of educate but don't indoctrinate so that we present Black authors that have opposing points of view, let the discussion occur, let it be guided by educators, but to have a real discussion and not just, as I said, at one point of view. Uh, my other question uh, had to do with the allies that have been identified, I guess, on the high school level. Uh, how were they identified? Uh, how do students know were the teachers given a questionnaire? Uh, and, you know, is this the beginning of asking teachers other personal questions like, you know, what is your point of view on climate change or on abortion or nuclear power or whatever? Um, just how are they chosen? How are they selected? How do students know who these allies are? And I can answer Grant that yeah, everybody I'm should be an ally, but um, oh, good, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's okay. I think I think that's a little a little bit of a leap to you know to talk about the personal questions, Dr. Elliot. You can answer, and I know Maxine, you've been on the student voice committee from the beginning, so maybe you, you also want to jump in there. How about Maxine? Why don't you start to answer, and then I can jump in later. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I am one of the leaders of the student voice committee. Um, and so how the um, anti-racist allies or ARAs are identified is with um, pins that they can put on their um, lanyards that they wear and they have stickers on their windows. And then for virtual students, we have profile pictures and backgrounds for their classroom that they can be identified. And the process that they were chosen is um, they had to submit a Google form explaining why they were interested in having the position. And then they had to submit an introduction video. So for us to watch and also for us to be able to post and for them to um, share to their students. So an anti-racist ally goes beyond a teacher that's willing to listen. And it's a teacher that has that um, maybe that personal experience or is really devoted to is going above and beyond to make our school a safer and better place. And as for the more personal questions, we don't think that those issues are as important, especially if it's discussing anti-racism. But if those are issues that become important in the future, then we could possibly address them. But right now, that's not something we're working on. Thank you, Maxine. Shannon, did you want to add? And then um, Mr. Mr. Laster or Seema? Sure. Um, the, the allies have volunteered. So no one was surveyed about their personal opinions. It was a volunteer, uh, you know, if, if they felt that they had the capacity and they wanted to do it and the passion to do it. The other thing that I'll offer is that I've been part of the book reads and the professional development at the high school, well, K-12. And um, it, we, it's important to, uh, to note, I think, that what we have read has not been one viewpoint. Um, it, they all have varying perspectives on the issue of racism. And so other viewpoints have been offered. Now, some can be more extreme, the leap can be greater, but um, we have already been doing that. So I just wanted to reassure you, Barbara, if, if you were thinking that we've only been saying one mantra, that's not at all the case. I was just looking at the list that Marie, you know, White Fragility, uh, Wendy's book and a couple of the others, and they are all of sort of the, the same. They're not the same. They're not the same because Wendy um, questions Du Bois um, 
white fragility has a very different perspective than let's say waking up white. Um, and I, 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 I just need to offer that as that isn't, they are not all the same. Thank well, you, Shannon, much appreciated. I'll, I'll also add um, to what Maxine said about the, the anti-racist allies that um, asking, asking the teachers whether they were interested in volunteering for something like this was a direct response from the student voice committee um, including, you know, some open forums where students discussed, you know, um, how safe and heard that they felt. And this was a specific need um, that was identified. And that's why, um, that's why the student voice group decided um, that this was a good next step. Uh, Seema, you're next. Oh, I just um, had two, I guess, uh, responses or I guess comments to Barb's questions. Um, one, I think you kind of just addressed Amy with the ally that I think the students tend to already know, at least some of them do, who they can go to, but maybe not all students know. So if, you know, if it's a volunteer, um, if it's something where they're volunteering to be a place where students can go to, I'd rather err on the side of students feeling safe, knowing they can go to somebody. So that's, I guess, just my opinion about that. Also, it kind of reminded me of the, um, I don't know, one of the board meetings we had, we wore those t-shirts in support of the students fighting cancer. and. I think there were some of us that wore them. I, I never questioned anybody who wasn't wearing a t-shirt that they were pro-cancer. It was just, you know, people buy them for whatever reason or, volunteer, you know, they support in whatever the way they can. It doesn't mean that if you're not wearing that, that you're, <laughs> that you're a racist, you know, just kind of a, some, somewhat of an equivalent. Um, the book piece, Dr. Wiles, I think talked about this in the past because a lot of times these books, a lot of the books, I think in the past year, a lot of people have been raising questions, but I think she said it best that, that it's not about indoctrination, but just a starting point to have a discussion like we would with any other book in any English class, that nothing that you're reading is saying you have to believe what we're reading, but it's just a discussion. And I think this kind of came up, I think it was a few years ago when we talked about all American boys. It's the same topic that's come up again. I know, Barb, maybe you asked it then too about giving one perspective, but I think the books give an opportunity, especially the novels, or um, you know, they're not history books. It gives students, I think, a way to talk about a topic that's in somewhat of a more safe space where there's a teacher able to, you know, talk with them through a conversation. That it's not a real life story. It might, you know, mimic, you know, uh, a real life story, but it's, you know, not real people. So they're able to talk about it in a classroom. I think that's a real advantage. For, for teachers to do that and to be able to offer that to their students. So just just my two cents. Thanks, Seema. Um, Shannon, I see your hand up, but does anybody have any other questions um, about the presentations? Okay, I just well, thank you. Down. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Laster? No, putting it down. No, I guess I, the only thing I wanted to, uh, Barbara, the, the approach that the allies are taking at the high school is the same approach that uh, we took back in 15-16 uh, when we started to implement uh, gender neutral bathrooms at the middle school. Uh, we, we basically partnered with the uh, Pride Center at Albany and Linden Cutlets. I think uh, there was a little information in the, in the presentation before. But we, we have a similar uh, program at the, at the middle school where teachers who volunteer can get a, a LGBTQ uh, rainbow sticker. They put it on their uh, classroom and it's a place and it's a visual representation where teachers, you know, students who have any questions or anything like that can go to those faculty members. I can tell you that it, it, it rolled out without any, uh, any questions. Many of our faculty members did it. And uh, some of our faculty members didn't, and that's okay. So um, it's just another way for our students to know who they can go access with those type of questions. So very similar approach that uh, the allies are taking right now. Thanks, Mike. I know the high school does have the, um, the LGBTQ safe space also. Dee? Uh, thanks. I, I guess I do feel like I, do, I need to respond as well when it comes to um, the literature out there, but not um, from my perspective, not what we're asking our adults um, to share or even our high school in terms of novels. Um, I, I want you to be rest assured that at least at the elementary level, the library department colleagues take a tremendous pains in finding every possible different 
uh, diverse titles that we can find and they're being used and they're being discussed. Um, and, and our littlest learners are starting early with conversations that are not from one particular viewpoint or not, but from stories that start conversations. Thanks, Delia. Um, as a parent of one of the littlest learners, I, I nod my head to you because we've enjoyed your library lessons very much this year remotely. Um, I think to add to that, I think many scholars of Dr. King would take umbrage with the way you described his, his stance on race or skin color. And that is the beauty of discussing literature and books that no matter who the, the authors are that are being brought in, there's going to be different reads on what those are. And um, it sounds like these educators are doing a good job of bringing those to our kids and having them talk about them. Thank you, Leah. Any other questions or responses on the presentations from Dr. Wilds and Dr. Elliott tonight? Elizabeth? I have a question. Uh, I'm just responding to what you just said, Amy. What is um, LGBTQ safe space? Uh, so it's what uh, Mr. Laster was pointing out where, um, again, similar to the anti-racist ally, you could get a rainbow sticker to put on your door and then, yeah. Oh, okay. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Elliott, for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Wiles, um, and thank Dr. Singleton for us for putting together um, all the information. It was great to hear um, all the work that has been done and is continuing to be done in our district. So thank you very much. Um, as we move on on our agenda, uh, we, have, we do have two more, two more agenda items tonight. And the next one is reporting out from the subcommittees. So just as a reminder to all of us here and those who might be watching, um, at our last subcommittee, we read the article from Educational Leadership, uh, The Illusion of Equity, the one that Gloria um, referenced. Um, and um, you know, we had that discussion in our subcommittees about um, uh, looking at the word effective um, and how it relates to learning and work around equity, what pieces of the article we could apply directly to the subcommittee, and how we think the article can inform the work um, of the larger committee. So um, if a representative, when I call this subcommittee, if a representative from the committee could um, give just a brief, um, a brief review of um, what your subcommittee thought of that learning component um, and maybe a status report also on where you are right now within the work in your, um, in your subcommittee, um, we will take the, um, the definition discussion. I know some subcommittees had a chance to review all the definitions and dis discuss them together. Not all of them did, so we'll leave we'll leave the definition conversation to our next um, our next agenda item, which is specifically discussion of the definition. So when I call on the subcommittee, if you could just let me know what your thoughts were on the learning component, and then an update on where your subcommittee is um, with its work. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going off the agenda. So we'll start with communications. Um, Maxine, I know you're the point person. Are you the reporter out today? Um, yes. So uh, I'm Maxine. I am the head of the communications subcommittee. Um, so with the first item, how do we find define effective as it relates to learning and work around equity? Um, a lot of our conversation was revolved around definitions, which Mr. Genovese did a ton of work on. So massive props to him. The definitions turn out really great and we'll get to those. But we need to have proper definitions of equity, diversity, and inclusion before we can talk about what effective means. And we worked on modifying the regents organization definitions so they're less bureaucratic and confusing to regular people and they make more sense. For the articles that we can apply to our subcommittee, um, we thought our job was to manage the conversations as because we were the subcommittee and to help uh, facilitate discussions about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And again, we worked on our definition and we want to work on having those conversations that get people out of the valley of humility and get people towards that positive change. And as for the larger community, uh, we wanted to create or get a personal development program and start small projects that can be federally funded. Um, I believe it was Dr. Wiles that brought up the amount of funding that we have available to us. And it's just amazing how much that we can use and where we can get it from. So if she wants to comment on that. And we want to make sure that we don't lose sight of asking the important questions. And we want to continue to show our improvements by keeping conversations alive and continuing to work hard. Awesome. 
Thanks, Maxine. Much appreciated. Uh, Kelly, did you want to add something? Yeah, I could, I could comment just really quick. It wasn't Marie that was talking about funding. It, it was me and it was a suggestion to kind of take a look at what things we could possibly do um, as our, as if it could fall into a category um, of a potential opportunity to, to see. So um, I just wanted to kind of just clarify that. That's Thanks. It. I'm so sorry, that was totally my mistake. Thanks, both of you. Um, so, Tibisai, uh, you're the point person for the community engagement. Are you a reporter tonight? Yes. So, um, based on conversations that we had had uh, in our March meeting, uh, we actually went rogue a little bit and we decided to do um, a presentation that I facilitated on some of the historical um, and legal uh, ways that uh, people have been dis disenfranchised in our country and specifically black people in our country. And we went through a history from 1865 to present day because we were having conversations around these issues and wanted to make sure that our committee, that not only do we have a clear understanding of history, but also that we start engaging in storytelling and building um, community within our smaller subcommittee um, and creating a space where we can have these in-depth conversations and bring up our understanding of history and then also clarifications um, as to different point of views of how things have happened. And we thought that that was really, really critical um, in order for us to, to move forward. So that's really what we spend um, a bulk of the time uh, doing at our last meeting. Um, but we did receive uh, two, uh, two, we did vote on two new committee members that are going to be added to our subcommittee. And we received about seven. So last week it was four that I mentioned to our subcommittee, but we've gotten like three more um, that I'm in the process of responding to. So those letters and those invitations definitely went out to community members and we have been seeing some of those returns um, and you know we're going to discuss after we selected the two new members we're going to kind of get together and figure out how we process and you know look at everybody that has shown interest and how we're planning to move forward uh, and you know so that's kind of where we're at right now we're also trying to it's really nice that we had that presentation around the anti-racism committee because we were looking in our committee to actually invite uh, members of the anti-racism uh, committee in to just give us a deeper dive and understanding as to what's going on in the high school so that was a really great primer uh, but we're trying to get a lay of the land as to what's happening so again we don't duplicate efforts and so that we can move forward in terms of the engagement and what we put together um, as action steps. So yeah, so right now things are in its infancy, um, but we're building and it's good that they're in their infancy because we have new members that are coming in, so. Thank you, Tibisai. Um, that was uh, actually a really good opportunity for me to talk about um, you know, the, all of the other volunteers that we're gonna have helping out our committee. Um, as you all know, uh, there were so many people that um, wanted to be part of the larger committee and we didn't have room for everybody. And so um, we did uh, send messages to those people who had applied to be on this committee um, to ask if they wanted to help out. Now, those members are not going to be board appointed official members of subcommittees, um, but they were um, they were told what the subcommittees were and asked if they wanted to participate and um, work with the subcommittees as, um, as we move forward. So um, each of the subcommittees I would expect um, I know our subcommittee also, Tivisai, has a number of people who are interested in, in helping us out with our work. And we're certainly grateful for that because um, there's plenty of work to go around. So um, so much appreciated. But I did just want to kind of clarify that point that they're not um, board appointed members of the subcommittee, but they are welcome to help and volunteer and, and work with the group. So um, much appreciated on that. Elizabeth, did you have a point of information or a question? Yes, um, I just wanted to say that Tibisai uh, walked us through history and it was really uh, interesting and enlightening. And I think we all felt on the subcommittee that it would be a very useful exercise for the full um, equity and diversity committee to undertake if, if there's interest. So I just wanted to say that. 
Thank you. Much appreciated. Uh, so uh, next is the research committee, Lois. I uh, actually today is Leah is going to be the reporter. We we rotate. Leah, are you? Yes, I'm ready. Ready. Thanks, Leah. Much appreciated. <laughs> Um, so we, we have done quite a bit of data gathering in the last month, um, and the article that we read for the shared learning kind of helped us in that what really stuck out to us was a sentence that limited awareness elevates perceived knowledge when you're very early in that graphic that we discussed. And one thing we discussed as initially of, of what related to our subcommittee was helping um, gather resources, various self-assessment tools around topics like implicit bias and other ways that people could share resources on the, the anti-racism page, um, people to do their own research, and then also making that a, a hub for trainings, um, programs, self-assessment tools, et cetera. We also have been doing some work reaching out to other school districts. Um, I was not on this call, but the rest of the committee was able to meet with the superintendent of Bethlehem and get some knowledge sharing about their work that they have been doing on the topic of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, we also have each picked a school in the region um, and done a, we're working on kind of one page case studies to share amongst ourselves. I presented last month on the Baldwinsville School District in central New York and have a meeting with their committee later next month. And our goal really is twofold, is one, get a sense of what other committees have done over an arc of two years as far as their focus is, and secondly, to glean what programs they've been using to do some of that work. Um, some things we've seen our 21 day challenge, the positivity project, uh, know yourself, know your students, know your practice, know your curriculum. That's very long, <laughs> but it sounded interesting. Um, so the, our goal really is to get best learnings, get some recommendations to make to the committee as a whole on possible programs. And then lastly, um, some research, continuing to research on options of doing some kind of award that either a student or educator each any given year, it might be of nominal financial value, but could go on a resume or an academic portfolio for college applications, things like that, where we're championing people who have worked hard over the last year to advance DE&I within the Gildeland community. Um, and lastly, we our next step is to start looking out for some other resources to work with us. It sounds like um, Timber Size Committee already got to start on that with kind of presentations, but we were hoping to reach out to SUNY, Sage, uh, Sienna, with a lot of S's, and um, see if we could get some people to do trainings or videos that we could also post to the website. And that's it. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Leah. Nicole, did you have something you wanted to add? I just had a question um, because we are talking about reaching out to similar to similar entities for presentations and stuff. I, I'm thinking it would probably be a good idea if we find out who's reaching out and when. So perhaps we can join together and get those presentations together, some of the subcommittees, instead of having those entities be reached out to multiple times Definitely. by different uh, subcommittees. I, th I think that would just be a really beneficial for everybody. That'd be great. I'd be happy to work with you on that, Nicole. Thank you very much. Great idea. That's definitely something the steering committee could help with too. So if you know if you if your subcommittee wants to reach out to someone and you let us know, we can kind of keep track of who's reaching out to whom, or we can um, Nidra, who I know is in here, but she's master of the Google spreadsheet and Google Docs, so she can help us certainly organize ourselves with that. Um, Mirzad. Well, just a brief detail. Uh, Lee uh, covered basically everything. The only thing I wanted to say is that we're currently working on a presentation to give within a either next month's meeting or the meeting following that just uh, regarding our one page case studies and you know what are some things we can take away from these other schools you know what are some similarities we have within our ED and I and uh, you know just how can we build off for the most potential coming in especially you know, implementing as year. much as we can. Thanks Mirzad. Elizabeth? Oh no hand up from earlier. Lewis? Uh, I have one one thing to add is uh, that <clears throat> we we want to work with the audit uh, subcommittee because the information we gathered from other school districts, their methods, their uh, activities, we may already have their resources. We may already have like what it, today what um, the superintendent Wiles uh, presented. So we <clears throat> kind of want to. 
uh, see what we already have. Um, I mean, what uh, what we can bring from um, the experience of other school districts. So uh, we might want to uh, uh, get really close uh, work with the audit committee on, on this piece of uh, content. And I think that's a really good point. I think although we're four separate subcommittees, I think a lot of the work is really um, intertwined. So I think it's helpful to uh, report out at our bigger groups. But if you're ever at a subcommittee meeting and you're saying, oh, you know, you're doing work in the research committee and you felt like, you know, oh, the engagement committee could really benefit from that, feel free in between meetings to share um, whatever you, um, you you feel like you want to share in between meetings. It's, that line of communication is always open. It, uh, also, we have uh, documented our communication with our meeting with other uh, school districts. You know, we have notes. Ben uh, did very good uh, uh, notes last time with the Bethlehem. We upload everything. If somebody is interested, please uh, take a look. Uh, and also, we have one person, I guess a student, who is really interested in doing researching um, on this uh, uh, EDI um, related topics, uh, my, we, we may bring it, uh, him to our next meeting. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, equity audit, I know I'm the point person, so I'll give a quick um, overview of our discussion, but I really welcome everybody else um, who's on the committee to please feel free to jump in. I'm sure I'm not gonna include everything. Um, so as I look at our notes from the last meeting, when we talked about um, the article and just the intersection of our work and the article and um, and the larger work, we had a conversation about you know defining the role of the audit and um, that you know how it is presented and what will happen once it's presented. Um, it's really important to make sure that the people who receive the audit understand the why behind it. Um, and related to the article, we talked about um, the peak of ignorance, you know, that perception versus reality as you're going through, um, you know, those professional developments or learning components, et cetera. And then um, the combination of that and then the idea of intention versus impact, um, right? When someone is at that peak of ignorance, they might have a good intention, but really um, truly not understand their impact um, in a harmful way. So um, we also brought up the idea of you know, whether we as a subcommittee, would we return to the work of an audit, like an annual survey or an annual review, or would this be, you know, in a larger form, because it is um, quite a, a large amount of work to do. Um, maybe it would be a small annual survey, but like in every five year, you know, how are we doing on um, each different, each different piece of the audit. Um, and then um, we do have quite a few volunteers um, that have asked to work alongside our committee, which is fabulous because um, as I mentioned, there's plenty of work to be done. Um, but we uh, broke up our next task. Uh, really our first uh, really large thing that we need to figure out is what the audit will look like. Um, and so we have a number of sample audits and then we also have templates. And so some of us are looking at sample audits and some of them are, some of us are looking at the templates and we're gonna break down, you know, what are the important components that we feel like, you know, what are the commonalities? What are the must-haves? Um, you know, a lot of these templates and sample audits are not Gilderland. They're different. They're different places, and so some of them may have pieces that are, yes, really important for us, or not, um, not as relevant. Or we might find we don't think they're as relevant, but maybe they really are as we dig deeper. And so, the very first thing that we're doing, and we are asking our out, our um, our incoming supporters to help us with, is really diving deeply into. Um, the sample audits and also the templates and also some articles, but um, specifically some templates of um, of equity audits that we've that we've looked at. So um, that's a pretty big that's a pretty big piece of work, but it's um, it's a really necessary first um, first step. So anybody else on the committee? Um, Gloria, Regan, Joe, D, um, Seema, anything that I missed? Okay. All right, I think, um, I think we did our questions for the subcommittees along the way, but does anybody have any additional questions for the subcommittees? Louis, I see your hand up. Is that a um, just residual hand from before? Oh, sorry, I should. Uh, no lower. problem. No problem, Tibisai? I just had a question around, you know, the composition of the subcommittee and looking at the equity audits and making sure that the eyes that are on um, that are giving you feedback 
are diverse and encompass our Gilderland community because they, as you were mentioning, people are going to look at things differently depending on how it impacts their communities. So if the subcommittee um, does not have that diversity in it to kind of gauge those pain points for specific commu communities, then we're not going to extrapolate the data that we need in order to support that community. So just mm -hmm. be mindful of things like that. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, I will take a look using the demographic representation data that we have, I can take a look at the um, the people who have volunteered to help out our subcommittee. Um, but if anybody wants to help um, help with that initial work, all hands on deck, much appreciated. So feel free to reach out and I can share that information with you. Um, I have a, a folder that I can share. Um, Barb? Just a quick question. Uh, how are we determining which people are joining our, our subcommittees? Are, are the committees themselves being able to select members or? In, on, on our committee, um, you know, people have asked to help us out. We gave them a specific task because that's our, that's our first task. And we're, you know, because they're very interested in the equity audit, we're allowing them to help us out. Oh, but, but they're, they're not. We don't have a selection process for helping us out. No. Barbara, I I, I can jump in here. Um, Thanks, Dr. West. About two weeks ago, we sent an email to all of the individuals who um, initially sent a letter to participate in this committee and just shared with them what the subcommittees are and said, do you have interest in serving on one of those? So they are selecting by area of interest and reaching out to the point people for each of those committees. So okay. it's it's individuals selecting what they're interested in working on. Okay, and then it's the committees themselves that are inviting the, the folks onto the committee. Yes. Thank you. The person, the um, they do have the names and contact information for the point people of each of the subcommittees, so they don't need to wait for an invitation. They can reach out individually to the point person. Seema? I just wanted to clarify. It sounded like that there was some language piece there that they're volunteers, right? Because we had a selection process for um, having people join. I, w I wouldn't want to say, you know, we told several people, you know, they weren't selected because we had way too many. We had so many, which is great, people interested. Um, and then, to, you know, right. So people are volunteering, I guess is what I'm saying, in the subcommittees for the different projects. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, to beside that, Maxine? I think that the concern is that subcommittees get too large and, and maybe things don't get done efficiently. So I think that that's why Barbara is, is kind of asking, like, are we supposed to just let everybody on? Do we do a selection process? Because, you know, for, for us in terms of engagement, um, we just, first of all, we want to know what, what the thought process is around these individuals. And, and then also making sure that it's a containable uh, a group of people in the subcommittee because it can, I mean, even this is pretty big and it can get difficult to get through everything that needs to get done. So I think that that's where Barb's mindset is coming from. Like, are we limiting? Are we just letting everybody on? You know, kind of hearing what other subcommittees are doing is really helpful because initially we had two people even prior to the letters going on saying that they were interested so we all voted and said, oh, okay, yeah, these two people sound good, let's let them on. So we just want to make sure that we're on par and that people aren't getting mad at us and say, well, this person contacted they and they were just let on. So I think that's why Barb is asking and that hopefully that clarifies. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point for our specific subcommittee. Again, like I said, we have like specific tasks that need to be done. So, um, so I think that um, a really great way for people to help the audit committee and volunteer is to help us with those tasks. So uh, Maxine? Um, now that we're talking about uh, people signing up for the different subcommittees, I, I have a question. Um, is this invitation exclusively to people who applied for this or is it possible? Because I know personally that there are students who weren't aware of this opportunity when it first arose. So I was wondering if we could extend this invitation further to other, other people. Dr. Ross, I- This was to, I think 
There were people though that emailed who did not apply, who wanted to right. just participate. I think that's what it was. Anyone who wanted to participate to contact that. Let us know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, you know, that depending upon whatever project that the, that group could decide, you know, the work that needs to be done and divvy, up, divvy that up. But I think there was no more appointing people because, you know, we went through the process, but I think it's open, at least that was my understanding. If there are, you know, people interested in participating. Mine as well. Barb? This is a follow-up question, a process question. Now, as these people join our committee, when we're having our subcommittee meetings, they will be on the Google Meet, correct? That they're not just outsiders given a task and told to go away. That they they'll be active participants on our committees. No, I think part of that depends on how your committee is run and what the different tasks are for your committee. I I do, I do think the 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 way the, all of the different committees work is a little bit different. You don't let it seem. To me, it would seem better if we're all uniform, if people are helping with the committee as we're having these smaller subcommittee meetings, it would seem to me preferable to, to have them participate, you know, live with their, with their fellow members that they're working with so that the better exchange of ideas is not just a paper trail. Um, I mean, I, I was looking forward to meeting these two new members and having a dialogue and you know, getting to know them. And it's the best way to do that is when we're having, we can't do it in person yet, but uh, these Google Meets are second best thing. So, I mean, I, I guess I would lobby, you know, for, for that structure. Yeah, it would be, I do think there's a balance, like Tibis I said, if you get to a group the size that we are, 24, um, then I think it would be, um, then I think it would be difficult to manage that conversation, right? So I think it's that balance of, oh, you know, yeah. if you're a subcommittee, you're already a subcommittee of six, one, or four or six, one of the reasons our subcommittees are small is so that we can hear everybody's voices. And so um, perhaps that might mean that the subcommittee needs to meet multiple times in smaller groups. Um, part of that's gonna depend on how many people are um, are volunteering for your subcommittee and what exactly you're discussing. What's the most effective way to get that done? Well, as I said, I, I don't think we're gonna get 24 people with, I think we had 60 people apply and maybe four or five people that didn't apply that are interested. You divide that by the, the four subcommittees. We're not gonna have a subcommittee of 50 people, I don't think. So I, again, I guess I would just, just say, I, I would love to have the interface of people who are volunteering, being able, you know, they're, they're not second class citizens. They're part of this committee. And um, at least I hope our engagement committee would, would, would do that and that, that others would follow suit. I think that interpersonal relationship that develops, um, you know, even over Zoom, uh, it is better than just handing somebody a task to do and say, okay, turn it in and thank you. And you want another one? <laughs> no, I, I, I think the point, I think the point is well taken, Barb. I think the interface is really important, but I also think that the subcommittee, like I said, maybe it means multiple meetings, um, you know, just to keep the numbers where they are. Um, but you know, if if we can interface, that would be that would be ideal. Um, but I just wanted to leave it open because I know maybe we don't think we'll have subcommittees of fifty. But like Maxine said, there are a lot of people who maybe weren't exactly aware of the opportunity, and I think there is a large amount of interest in this committee as a as a community. Um, and so I, I do think we're going to get quite a few people that are um, that are interested, and I want to make sure that everybody's voice is heard. So. Maybe that happens over multiple meetings, um, but and and that might I'd love to see some consistency, but it might be a little different based on what the different subcommittees are doing and how many people they have. Elizabeth, yeah, um, just for the you know sake of um, sort of continuing this discussion, um, I guess I don't know how many people we have now on the engagement subcommittee. Is it like eight or something? I don't know. But um, so if, if we now have two that we've already added, and then we have seven, as Tibisai said, that are interested, and then Maxine suggested that we should have students, which is a great idea, but I don't know, I don't know how that's going to work, but that's a good, good idea. Um, I'm just saying it's going to double if we put those nine people on now, it will double. So, you know, like our kind of intimate sense of, of the subcommittee is going to just change, that's all. So um, I just wanted to point that out. So. Um, I like Maxine's idea. I think we should talk about how we can maybe incorporate that because we've 
uh, lamented before that we don't have any, um, you know, this is supposed to be about, you know, anti-racism and we uh, were sorely underrepresented in terms of, you know, black high school students, for instance. So um, not that we're saying, you know, you have to be a black person to, you know, from, from, from the high school to be a student to get on the committee, but I'm just, I'm, you know, I think um, it could be good to have more young people who are, you know, boots on the ground, you know, at the high school or the other school. Thanks, Elizabeth. Mike? I don't, I don't know why we would uh, pass up the opportunity to increase the number of people who are involved in this conversation about anti-racism in our community. I think we have to do that with fidelity, but I don't know if we should not include them in the conversation. Good point. So it sounds like um, it sounds like we need to do some thinking about making sure that we're including people in our conversation, and also at the same point, um, having a balance of making sure everybody's voices are heard. Um, so it's something for the individual subcommittees to perhaps discuss how they're going to handle that, and maybe bring it back to either the steering committee or to the larger committee. Um, but I think this is a good problem to have. Amy, let me just jump in and suggest this. Perhaps sure. we hear from our subcommittees on how much interest that they're receiving. Um, because I know that when we got initial interest here, there were individuals who said, well, I'm interested in three subcommittees. And so if one is getting really large, um, we could say, um, you know, public engagement is getting very large. Would you like to join, you know, a different committee? So we can help manage that because I'm going to agree with Mr. Laster that um, this is about inclusivity. So let's include. So I, I am going to keep an eye on the time because we still haven't touched the definitions yet. But if we have one or two last statements on this topic, that's OK. Um, Elizabeth and Barb. Oh, OK, um, yeah, I think our subcommittee is planning to have, um, as Tip I mentioned, um, have the uh, anti-racism committee and the black student union both come and present to one of the subcommittee meetings so that's going to be a good way you know to sort of start to um, hear from students who might be interested in because um, you know they're already committed to to this so they might be interested in, in reaching out and being part of this so but I like Maxine's idea I think we should go back to it sometime and try to figure out how to get more students in thank you Barb one last comment on this uh, just to back up, when we chose the subcommittees, you know, that we wanted to be on, we ranked them. And so if we were to do the same thing with, as you said, if Maria, if had, there's an overflow, um, I, that worked out fine, I think, you know, for, for us. And I think it would, it would work out equally as well, you know, for the volunteers. Right. Good idea. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. So our last... Um, our last item on our agenda is the discussion of the definitions. So um, if we uh, looked on the on our board portal, um, there is posted the New York State Board of Regents framework. Um, and I know the communications committee, uh, Deb did send out the definitions um, that we're working on. And this is a draft of the definitions. So I think what, um, what we'd like to do tonight is get some thoughts out. Thank you, Dr. Wiles. Um, get some thoughts out on the definition of these three terms. We'll go term by term um, and um, we see what's on the page. If you have any other pieces of input, you can add it tonight. And then what we'll do is we'll take, um, we'll kind of, Dr. Wiles said she would uh, graciously take some notes and then we'll also um, use this as a recording to kind of go back and say, what are the commonalities between what we have on the page and what are the comments that people made um, and then we'll craft our definitions um, a little bit more from there. Um, so I think we'll start with equity. Uh, so um, you can use the hand raise if you want, but does anybody have, like I said, we're looking for something different than what's on the page um, that you, um, you feel is important to include in the definition. Amy, can I suggest that we call on Andy to um, walk through this a little bit because sure. he's the member of the communications committee. And I have to say, and Maxine said it earlier, major props. He did a ton of work and there's some thinking behind this that maybe will help it come off the page a little bit. 
Sorry, Andy, for putting you on the spot. Okay, really quickly. So, so the notion is we definitely have to, to share uh, common definitions. Um, this is standard for any project where you have a glossary right up front so you know what you're doing. But the importance is, is that there are definitions that just like diversity and inclusion can be understood and related to and reflected by anybody. So what I did with this and what we did with this was have three levels of this. So the first level, like for example, in the first one, equity equals fairness. This is like, you know, the very, you know, simple, straightforward headline um, level that's out there. Then the second is a little deeper. Okay. And then the third level, which, which is really close to what the, uh, the state ed and the regents did, okay, is the more detailed level because we need to build everything upon this. This becomes the way we get the whole community thinking and talking, um, you know, about what equity, diversity, and uh, inclusion means. And we find a way in these definitions to to let everyone see, just as we want to do in. In, in the school itself, how to do that. Just as we want a teacher to stand up there and make sure that a lesson, a message is, uh, is, is understood by all the students in their class, we need a way to make sure that all the people in our district, staff, students, parents, whatever, can find themselves in our definitions. Thank you, Andy. Uh... Like Matsine said, major props. So we'll start with equity. Uh, does anybody have any comments um, or input they feel would be important to include in our definition of equity? Gloria? I appreciate what you just did, Andy, for that, uh, because that really helps me understand the way that's leveled. Um, and it makes a heck of a lot of sense now. I like that equals thing. It's kind of like a quick handle to remind you the fairness piece. And then it should that should immediately lead to uh, what's fairness. And then finally, well, it's an example of fairness. How do you keep fairness? So I really like the way you did that, that committee did that. Yeah, you know, if, if Mike, if you could, could speak just for a second, at our committee meeting, you really spoke eloquently why these simple terms of fairness, openness, and kindness would be useful to you in, in your work. Yeah. Well, I, so thank you, Andy. I mean, I think that uh, what we tried to do in the communication subcommittee <clears throat> is make it, uh, you know, simplistic and then sort of uh, define sort of what we meant by what we were saying. But, you know, in terms of how we could use these you know, themes, equity equals fairness, diversity equals openness, inclusion equals kindness. I mean, I, I can envision, you know, some different activities, some different months, some different, uh, you know, focused activities on those three themes, K-12, you know, uh, we, could, we could ask, you know, students, we could ask teachers, hey, how, you know, how, how, how have you, uh, you know, how have you been fair today? You know, give me an example of, of uh, you know, how, uh, you know, you've you've shown kindness today. Those are tangible, uh, you know, actions that I think we could we could measure and we could do activities with. And it could be some common language that a kindergartner could understand kindness and a 12th grader can understand kindness. Um, so, you know, I, I think that as we discussed in our subcommittee, we really tried to find language that could be understood by everyone. Thanks, Mike. Nora? Uh, yeah, so I was just going to say, I think we all, at least I know Gloria said she did, understood a lot better with the uh, kind of definition of like three tiers. So I was wondering if there's any way we could make like that clear to the audience that's going to be uh, looking at this, like whether that's a visual like graphic design or like just writing it at, at the top. Good input. Good input. So, you know, when these are published, whether it be on a website or, you know, however they're published, I think that'd be um, an important um, piece of information to craft at the top, like an in, almost like an introduction statement. 
Well, either in, an introduction statement or almost like some type of flow chart that explains sort of, is that what you're thinking, Nora? Some type of visual? Yeah. Yeah. That was what I was thinking. Awesome. Maxine? Going off of what Mr. Laster, Mr. Genovese just said, like the, the three words, like to me, like when someone says like, what are the four pillars of character? I immediately go to like the caring, honesty, respect, responsibility. So I think that our, our goal was to make this something that you can, you can ask a kid, what is EDI? And they know exactly what it means and how they've had an example of that. And I think the idea of a visual is great, Nora, and the idea, and also Mirzad put something in the chat about it, but I think that that's sort of the goal that we're aiming towards. And I think that it's awesome that Mr. Genovese has put so much hard work into this for us. Gloria? I wonder if we could uh, use something like a triangle, you know, get the three legs or something like that as a symbol with the words and that could trigger, you know, those other words, you know, the equity, diversity, inclusion, and then triggered fairness Oh, it's kindness. Gloria, it's funny that you say that because when I, uh, so, so the quote that I added at the bottom, I envisioned like a dancer, like a, a like a, a visual of a dancer, like a ballerina or somebody like in a triangle that had at the top and like, you know, some kind of visual like that. I'm not yeah. an artist. I will defer that to Shannon and other <laughs> people who are, are, are more, more artistic than me. Right. I, I thought that that could be something that we could like, Play that could, on that could be a lo the logo, the right, right, the trigger that makes us think that. And I mean, it, it works for staff. It works for everybody to use those things. You know, how is my activity fair to everyone? How is my activity open to everyone to participate? How is what I'm planning in this lesson showing kindness or allowing people to feel like they're being treated kindly? Things like that. Uh, it's a power. Those are powerful words. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, I mean, you could you you could use this as we could start getting classes to do presentations for little videos we could put up about this is how we treat each other with fairness. This is how we treat each other with this. You can have T-shirts because what you're trying to do is establish some memes. This is the 21st century, right? Everything is quick and sharp and all that, but we want to avoid, you know, um, not having the depth, and that's why there's the three levels of this. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure we're going back. Um, we're on we're on equity. Did anybody have any input specifically on equity? Ben, I'll let you go first. Hey, um, can everyone hear me? Okay. So, um, so I, I don't know that I have a um, that I disagree with the definition, um, but you know what I what I want to try to remember is that we're not just trying to um, you know, be, be nicer, right? You know, we're, we're not just trying to, um, you know, give kids mottos that they have, right? I mean, we, we already teach kids to be fair and, and open and kind, um, but we want, you know, to pursue changes potentially to the way that we do things. And, um, you know, one of the things that I like about the concept of equity is that it's not equality. And, what I like about that is our students are all going to go different places. Um, they need different things to succeed because they're going to succeed in different ways. And um, so, you know, I, again, I don't disagree with this definition, but I, I wish there was something in there uh, about individualizing, you know, um, resources or instruction um, that, you know, uh, differentiating resources and instruction for different students um, because, um, you know, I think the idea here that, that equity is really trying to get at is not, you know, let's, let's be fair to people um, and maybe, you know, uh, give this student extra um, time for, for, for test prep or, or whatever, um, when really we should be looking at the test. Right and and um, and making sure that that is is um, appropriate for the student. Um, so, um, you know, maybe that would go in that third tier. Um, maybe maybe language 
Um, well, ben, ben, that's exactly why I wrote the, the second level of this. The first thing in the definition is equity is different from equality. Equality means giving everyone the same thing, but equity means being fair to everyone by giving them what they need to succeed. And then when you look at the definition of diversity, it says diversity means being open to what makes each of us unique and bringing those different identities and perspectives to our school community. So I, I, that's we really tried hard to reflect exactly what your concerns are. So to, to be more specific, my concern is with the words fair and succeed because those will depend on um, you know, what, what the child's trying to succeed at and what the specific barrier to that success is. Um, you know, it, it, my point is that these seem that these definitions seem kind of um, personal to me, as in between people. Um, and for purposes of the school district, we might want definitions um, that relate to processes or structures. I would add. Um, I understand what you're what you're thinking, Ben, but I would I would add that this is a real really a human and personal business, and so. Um, like the business of schools. And so I think it should be a personal definition. That's just my own um, personal opinion. Um, but no, I, I, I think there should be some, um, a human factor in there because um, yes, we're dealing with the system and we're trying to lead the system in a way that is more um, equitable and a way that is more diverse and inclusive. Um, but as we deal with the system, we're dealing with individual people and therefore there needs to be a human element um, a personal element um, within these definitions. Um, any more input to the specific term of equity from anyone? Because um, otherwise we can move on to diversity. Gloria? Would it help? I don't know if it'll help, but would it uh, mean anything to put uh, where it says being fair to everyone by giving them resources they need to succeed? I, I don't know if that's too limiting. Yeah, I think that I think that's a good point. Um, or by providing them the resources needed to be successful, or something like that, would that it, be it, more? Specific? As long as we're as long as we're broad enough, because um, yeah, that's right, what I mean. It could I don't end up, to, yeah, it could end up being limiting. limiting. Right, yeah, I don't it want it to be limiting. limiting. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth and Joe. So. Um, this is very similar to the, um, the definition that Tibisai had given, but the definition that Tibisai gave just, it had fewer words um, and I did like it. Um, so just to throw it out there um, as a possibility, it was giving people what they need in order to make things fair. So it wasn't, it wasn't focusing on the success, it was focusing on the fairness, um, going along with what Ben said. Um, so anyway. That's an interesting difference for us. To the reason, guys, the reason I did that is so I could be consistent in the definitions. Mm -hmm. So it could say being fair, being open, being kind. Okay, that mm -hmm. was the only reason I did it, it that way. But th that really was based upon Tibisay's definition. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. Um, Joe. Yeah, thinking a little bit about what um, what Gloria had mentioned. Um, I think we can talk about providing resources, but. Um, I think that's kind of part of a, of a broader piece because when I've, as I've read about this topic and things, they talk about removal of barriers as well, right? And that's not so much that I've given you more than someone else. It's I've, 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 uh, I've provided more routes for access. I'm sorry, I'm not coming up with quite the right words there, but I, I think people understand what I'm, what I'm trying to say. So. Yeah, I think so, Joe. Okay. Lori, is that a, a hand up from before or a new one? Which I'm sorry. Did you have another another I'm sorry, that was, I didn't All right, so mind. so we'll move on. We'll move on to diversity. So um, moving on when we take each of these definitions, we'll take the definitions as we have them and all the input from the meeting and we'll um, we'll wordsmith it and craft it from there, right? Um, but I think we have some um, valuable input here. So any input on the definition for diversity?
Okay. Um, all right. Well, Andy did a great job on that one. Um, <laughs> any, any input on the definition for inclusion? Sandra? Yes. Um, first of all, Andy, I think you did a great job on this stuff. More power to you there. Um, with inclusion, um, I love the idea of kindness, but I was I'm thinking, and I know it's supposed to be kind of a one word thing, but I think that it, it has to be maybe some interaction involved in it. So um, like kindness is good, but it's not enough. Like you can be kind to people without developing an interaction with them. There's a social piece to inclusion. Mm -hmm. And I think you hit on it later where you say, um, it includes authentically bringing excluded individuals into processes and activities. But I mean, that's the part that has to do with the word interaction. So it, the kindness has to go beyond just being nice to people and actually developing an interaction and bringing in, in that bringing in. Well, that, 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 that's why I took the words right from the educational philosophy um, uh, thing. It, it says kindness, uh, inclusion means being kind to all our students, families, and employees by making them feel safe and welcome. I mean, that's the, that's our whole point, right? I mean, that, that's what I heard from Dr. Elliot and everybody. We want to make people safe and they need to feel welcome in the school because those are not feeling safe and not feeling welcome are, are the biggest barriers to not learning. Okay. So, so I just pulled that right out of the educational philosophy that, that's on the website. And the, the, the second piece of that is the, the ed department's uh, definition. So thanks, Andy. Sandra, I'm really glad you bring this up. And um, it's really interesting timing for me. It's um, uh, Autism Awareness Month. And um, so I've been thinking about it quite a bit this month. And um, I've always thought, you know, the phrase making people feel, feel safe and secured or feel welcome um, always lacks an authenticity to me. And so I think that um, the difference between kindness and um, genuine inclusion is that authenticity is that um, you're you're not just um, you're not just saying you're including people, but you're authentically um, authentically including people um, and everyone in that. And so um, yeah, I mentioned the Autism Awareness Month because um, I have read quite a number of you know highlights and spotlights this month specifically related to that, and um, that's one of the threads that that is woven throughout. Is you know it's one thing to say we're going to include; it's another one when people. Um, are genuinely included. So, um, so I thought that was really interesting that you include that. Um, ben, yeah. and then Gloria. Yeah, I was just gonna um, echo pretty much that same point about, um, you know, inclusion to me means more participation, right? Um, that you're part of, part of the process, part of the discussion, um, which, which seems to be worked in a little bit into the definition of diversity on, on this page. Um, but I, I've always associated that part with, with inclusion, maybe because that's what it's looked like in Gilderland, um, kind of integrating our, our special education students. Um, and then the other comment I have is about, um, you know, making them feel, um, you know, we, we really can't control how, how people feel. Um, we can try to make them feel safe and welcome. Um, and I think that that, again, speaks to the fact that it's a, it's a process, it's a conversation, it's a, it's a participation in building a community, um, and and there's going to be rough spots, but but we're all trying to treat each other with respect and make sure everyone's included. I'll also um, thanks, Ben. Um, I'll also caution. Um, you know, I think it's um, I think even even though well intentioned, I think some of these particular words um, um, make people become othered um, within the community, and I, I would I would caution us at that. Um, so Gloria, and then Tibisai and Leah. Uh, I won't go over. I, I agree with the many things that have been said about the lack of depth sometimes with the words. But you know, I was thinking more of building relationship. The word relationship for inclusion, um, or seeking relationship, or building relationship, seeking to bring people in. I couldn't come up with one word, but with relationship kept coming up. Yeah, Tibisai then Leah. Tibisai, your hand was 
your hand was up, but maybe not. Leah, then Sorry, Marzan? No, no, I didn't unmute myself. I put my hand down oh, and didn't unmute myself. Apologies. Okay. So I can't see everybody. <laughs> It's okay. Um, so what I was going to say, when I think about inclusion, I think about wanting my voice to be heard and being my perspective, being a part of the process, right? So that's actionable and intentional. Um, I'll be frank here. Do I know that not everyone is going to love me? And I know that not everyone is going to feel kindly towards me but I want there to be enough respect in the room that when I am saying what I am saying, that it is being considered and being considered from multiple frames, from the frames of, I have not had my voice centered because of X, Y, Z identities in the past. So it should be considered. Um, and I do, I feel like, I feel like we mask, um, Kind, like kindness is something that we hide behind um, in order to say, well, we're being kind to you. It's like, yeah, cool, but you're really not considering me. You're not putting me into the mix. You're not utilizing what I'm telling you to really inform the decisions that are being made. So I do think that there needs to be some actionable steps around that. Um, as far as the feeling of safety and you know, feeling welcome, it's, it's interesting, but when I, I understood really well what um, Andrew did in trying to make sure that these were broad enough that they could be put up as a lens from which to start from when you're looking at any process, when you're looking at any action that you're taking and, and making it so that everyone can utilize it in, in the way that it's meant to be utilized but maybe it's that the definitions need to come with how do you use these definitions when you're looking at processes? How do you use them when you're looking at programming, when you're thinking about interactions in the classroom? Because all of those are, are, are various layers. So I know that we get into some wordsmithing and we don't have a lot of time, but I just wanted to give that perspective about, yes, I do think that inclusion needs to be more actionable. Um, and, and center action, but I do understand and totally am like rooting on Andrew for the work that he's done on this. Thank you, Tibisai. Leah, then Mirzad. Um, I wanted to point out that I thought we had a really beautiful example of inclusion uh, that took place in the meeting earlier today when Dr. Elliot was speaking and then uh, Maxine raised the question about multiracial representation. And there was a quick exchange where the question was asked in a respectful way and the answer was given in a respectful way. I hope that the people involved took it that way. That's how it looked to me. Um, and I, that to me kind of works into this inclusion definition. Some words I wrote down was um, dignity uh, or humility, maybe into, into maybe we could incorporate those words behind the, uh, the way we're bringing in excluded groups because it's not necessarily just being friendly or kind, it's also affording someone um, some non-defensive listening and some, some dignity. So maybe that could make this a little bit more of an action word. I'm not, I'm not sure. Cultural humility is a phrase I like a lot um, personally, yeah. but I don't know if everybody likes it. <laughs> well, Thanks, it's funny, Leah. Leah uh, I, so I read an article the other day about cultural humility, and that's perfect. I think we, we could add that, and I think that encompasses a lot. So it does. We might have to define it, Mr. Laster. Um, Mirsad, then Bar. Um, just something brief. My words uh, aren't as strong as cultural humility, but I think that they might be a little bit more, um, you know, basic or just to the to the average reader in this case. A few that floated up in my attention. Um, Maxine said accepting. I modified it to acceptance, essentially the same thing, as well as togetherness, possibly. I'm thinking acceptance, though, in the sense that we say inclusion <clears throat> means being kind to all our students, families, and employees by making them feel safe and welcome. So, you know, accepting them into who we are, as well as including authentically bringing them in. So accepting, you know, what are their differences within the two of them? I don't I don't know if it would play well there, but that's that's just what I was thinking. Uh, just just let me add quickly. There's a lot out there in the literature about the misunderstanding of kindness. 
Kindness is not niceness. A surgeon who is cutting into someone's chest to save them, you know, from having a heart attack, okay, is being kind. They may not be perceived as nice. So, so that's part of the, the whole thing people have to learn about what kindness really means. Thanks, Andy. Sandra, can I just go back to you to make sure, is your hand up? Okay, thanks, sorry about that. Um, Barb, and then Andy, if you had something else? This was just a quickie. I think it was Kelly that suggested the word welcoming, and I, I like that a lot. And then again, the action word relationships. Um, but Andy, I think has done a fantastic job. And if you just want to tweak that that kindness thing that a lot of people have made different suggestions, um, I think we have a great start here. I would agree. I think we really do. And I'll certainly make sure that um, that we'll copy off the chat because there were a lot of good suggestions in the chat that I haven't been able to fully follow. Uh, to the side, then Nicole. What I was going to say is that I think that the what's sitting in the pit of my stomach is the power dynamics that are not being addressed by the word kindness. And inclusion is about making sure that the power dynamics and the power structures that exist now get pulled out so that way everybody that's around the table can have an equal say and can give equal input and they're, they're being considered as, you know, having the same amount of power, right? So I think that's why kindness is hard for me and why I'm talking about action is because when you don't confront the fact that there are different power dynamics based on different identities, then you're still doing the same stuff, right? Th that addressing that power dynamic becomes really important within the definitions. And I think in diversity, it does a really good job at calling out what all the groups are, but then there's no nothing anywhere that really I feel addresses the fact that there are differentials and power dynamics that exist. And what we're trying to do, as we were mentioning before, is level that playing field. So I want to be welcomed, but <laughs> but like the quote says on the bottom, hey, my music should be in rotation at the party. Yeah, my music should be in rotation at the, at the party too. So I, I, I like the, the visual at the bottom because it, yeah, it addresses a little bit power dynamics, but making sure that that's fully realized somewhere in this definition, I think is going to give it more teeth and is going to speak to the heart of what we're actually trying to do. Thanks, Tibisai. That was really helpful. Um, and I'll say here, here, uh, Nicole and Kelly. Just quickly, the word that keeps coming to my mind when we talk about inclusion is when I work with different, um, in my professional life with different entities, we always talk about collaboration. And I feel like that is a way to get people included and have the take out the um, whole, you know, hierarchy, perhaps. And, and, and um, Joe had put in um, the chat about partnering, just put really kind of making that so it's a it's a relationship, because I exactly agree what Sandra said about this needs to be an action of relationship. So that was a word I was coming up with that kept coming into my head. And then um, I know had Ben had identified about uh, concerns about them making them feel safe and welcome. And I was just thinking, um, perhaps by saying, by providing opportunities to feel safe and welcome or something like that. So a person, we're not making them feel, but we're giving opportunities and, and, and you can see how that is taken. Thank you. That's an actionable piece that Tibisai was talking about that's important. Um, Kelly? Thanks, Amy. Um, something that's sitting in my stomach is kind of like, even though I said the word welcoming in there, it's sitting with me as like, what what are we welcoming, welcoming people to? Like, welcome into my world, come into my world, I'll accept you or whatever. Like, I'm kind of like, it doesn't sit well, it's just not sitting well with me. I'm, I feel like it should be a different type of word um, for inclusion. It's not maybe not coming out right, and maybe somebody else could, Kind of say what I'm saying a little bit better, but um, do, do you under, kind of right belonging? Belong, belonging to what? Like, what's our like? 
it's like our community that everybody should be involved with equally from all different perspectives. I feel like I'm, I don't want to invite people into this, this, this community that we have built over the past 40 years. You know, I'm, I'm just it's kind of what I'm struggling with right now. Thanks. So, so I struggled with the, uh, the all of the stuff that that you guys have been bringing up when I was playing with this, you know, for a long time. And this was the this was the toughest one. And you know, when I started, when the kindness occurred to me, and I started researching it, there's kindness, there's kindred, you know, there's all there's all all are one, you know, kinds of stuff, you know. So that's why I mean, I went on and on and spent hours torturing over, you know, the word. And I said, well, you know, you know, kindness is something we know every day, and we can define it as we want, and that may be uh, the essential. Um, conversation we have to have at every level that what does kindness actually mean because you know there, there's more to our document on this we have some other questions that we want to ultimately answer on the web website and the next question after uh, Cynthia Olmedo's quote is um, you know and, and what do we do about all this stuff what does this actually look like you know on the ground thanks Andy so we are getting very very close to nine o'clock um, I know we have um, Gloria and Elizabeth, um, but we're going to try and um, try and end before um, before too late. So Gloria or Gloria, I put it in the chat. Just the word after listening to Tipisai, I, I was thinking the word voice. Having a, to be included means your voice is heard. So you know that to me is much more than just hi. You you're welcome here. You know, but. I'm listening to your voice. I value your voice. Your, you know. Thank you. I think everybody else um, who has their hand up has already spoken. But if um, if I miss that, that's okay. Um, I want to thank everybody for a great meeting tonight. I know it was really really long, but we had a really long agenda, and I think um, I think we were pretty productive tonight. We saw some great presentations and. Um, had a pretty productive discussion around these definitions. So we'll take a look at, um, I've copied and pasted the chat already, um, and um, we'll take a look and see some commonalities and um, listen over to the discussion to see what needs to be um, added and adjusted. But just want to thank everybody. Um, are there any motions to adjourn the meeting tonight? <laughs> All right, uh, so we'll take Gloria second. Andy, all in favor. All right, so we'll close the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Great discussion.